We are going to uh, start today with a little bit of review of chapter six. We have covered the first four chapters, um, but I think um, it would be good for us to, to do the review of these because um, chapter six is quite um, an amazing chapter. There's so much in there uh, that we maybe don't understand, and we just ask God's wisdom to help us search it out. And each of us has to do that on, our, on her own um, because um, we, can't, uh, we can't just trust what we hear. We have to uh, be like a Berean and, and search out the scriptures. So I'm going to read, and you read, follow along with me on chapter 6, the first four chapters. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. And there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Wow, there's a lot packed into there, so we're going to break it down uh, a little bit. Uh, there are many great teachers, and they are divided on this subject. There are really two views of uh, chapter 1, of, excuse me, of, of um, verse 1, the sons of God. Uh, the one view is that these refer to the sons of Seth, the godly line of Seth, and that the daughters of men uh, are the line of Cain, the ungodly, so to speak, um, line of Cain. And this was taught uh, for many years from probably the, the 4th century A.D. Uh, throughout today. Many of the Protestant churches are still teaching that, and uh, many good teachers uh, believe that. Uh, the other view is that the sons of God were angels that had fallen, and they came down and they took human wives. So I'm going to break it down and uh, just see what we can find in the Bible to try to give us a little more information. Uh, the sons of God are mentioned elsewhere in the Old Testament and in the New, and we're going to look at the Old Testament first. And I want you to turn to Job 1.6, uh, where it talks about the sons of God. And it says, Now there came a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also was among them. And that was referring to angels. Now we go to Job 38, 7, And the Lord asked Job, Where were you when the morning stars and the sons of God shouted for joy? Now, here God is pointing out that the sons of God, the angels, were present at the creation. Uh, then we want to look at the phrase sons of God in Hebrew and see what uh, that really means in Hebrew. And it actually means directly created by God. Uh, Adam was directly created by God. Uh, Eve was directly created by God. The angels were directly created by God. However, anyone born after Adam and Eve, any of their progeny, were, were born uh, through their mother and their father, through the womb of the mother. So they were not directly created by God. So there's a real distinction there uh, between uh, the sons of God and the daughters of Adam. And looking at the daughters of man, in Hebrew it is Adam. Adam means mankind. So the phrase is daughters of mankind. So here we have, in Hebrew, the sons of God, the angels, came down and saw the daughters of mankind and thought that they were beautiful, and they desired them. So uh, this was taught from ancient times. The, the ancient Hebrew scholars all taught, almost all of them taught, that those were angels that came down. Those were fallen angels. And that was taught throughout until the fourth century. And Augustine uh, in the Catholic Church uh, decided to make that change. And, and then from then on, uh, it was taught that those were the, the sons of Seth, the line of Seth. Um, our early church fathers taught that those were fallen angels. 
So uh, we have quite a bit of evidence on this side, from my point of view at least. Um, that's something you have to decide on your own. Uh, but let's go to uh, John 1, 13. And Yeshua Jesus is saying, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. So here we see the sons of God in the New Testament. So how can we uh, compare that to the Old Testament, sons of God directly created by God? Well, I'll continue on with that. Um, as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So we become sons of God when we become believers, and we are reborn. So we are then new creations. So then we are sons of God. Um, We also can go to uh, the ancient uh, history books and uh, apophical books that uh, actually the Book of Enoch was one that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. And uh, that particular book was written in 3rd century BC and it also includes a lot of, um, a lot of history about the angels um, saying that those were fallen angels and uh, we can we can consider that not uh, not holy scripture, but as history, and it was uh, quoted by uh, Yeshua's brother, half brother uh, Jude, and uh, I think if you can go to Jude six, uh, it refers to that. Now, uh, there's always a question asked: uh, if angels don't marry, how could they father children on earth? Um, and that comes from Matthew 22, 30, uh, where Jesus said, For in the resurrection they shall neither marry nor are given in marriage, but as are the angels of heaven. So let's go back and see uh, what we can learn about angels. And uh, we understand that they are spirit beings, but we also understand that they can take the form of man. And uh, in Genesis 18, 2 through 8, I'm going to read that for you. As an example, he, meaning Abraham, lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him, and when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door, and he bowed himself forward the ground, and he said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree, and I will fetch you a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts. After that you shall pass on, for therefore are you come to your servant. And they said, So do as you've said. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes Excuse me. upon the hearth. And Abraham ran to the herd and fetched a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man, and he hasted to, to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he dressed and set them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. And so here we see uh, he received them as men, and they were eating. Um, in Genesis 22, while the Lord pre-incarnate remains with Adam, these are the same three men, we understand that one was, was Jesus Christ pre-incarnate, and the other two men set out for Sodom, and they had a purpose to go to Sodom. And then when we go on to Genesis 19, uh, 1 through 16, these two men are now called angels. And it says that Lot took them into his home for rest, nourishment. They did eat, and uh, I'm sure he took them in for protection as we uh, read through the next few verses. The men, young and old, from all over the city of Sodom were attracted to them and wanted to know them. And, of course, we understand the word know um, means to have uh, relations with them. And because of the city's great sin, it was marked for destruction. And in the early morning, as we go to verse 16, 
While Lot lingered, the men laid hold of, upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hands of his two daughters, and the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him forth, and they set him without the city. So here we see they looked like men, they ate like men, they drank like men, and they grabbed on to the hands of Lot and his family, just as a man would. So now we want to go to Hebrews 13.2 and see what Hebrews has to say. And it says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. So angels can appear to us as men, and we don't even realize the difference. But could they have fathered children, as indicated in Genesis verse 4? If we go to Jude 6, as I mentioned before, where it says, The angels kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains unto the judgment of that great day. And here he's referring to those angels from all indications. Uh, and here it says, they left their own habitation. Now that word in Greek is oikaterion, and it's only used twice in the Old Testament, once here and once in 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.2. Now the word oikaterion means heavenly body, and it means that these angels were somehow able to leave their spiritual bodies and take on the form of a man. They left their oikaterion, and they became as men. Now, in 2 Corinthians, this reinforces the meaning of oikaterion, and it says, We as believers groan in our desire to be clothed with our heavenly bodies. And there the word is oikaterion again. Here we have our old tents on now, our old habitation, but we are so desiring to have that new oikaterion, that heavenly body which the, the angels in their heavenly bodies left. And ours won't be like theirs, but ours will be our own heavenly bodies. So here we kind of had an understanding. We can't really know how this all worked, how, you know, all the different parts of it. But it seems to indicate that they were able to do that. And so um, it just kind of reinforces this whole idea that these are the sons of God, that the, the fallen angels did come down. Um, now I want to take us to verse 4, which uh, begins with, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. And when we see the phrase, also after that, this refers to after the flood. So we understand there were giants pre-flood, and somehow there were giants after the flood. And we know this because the Bible continues on in Genesis and in Leviticus and, and several other places uh, where it refers to giants. And then we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but, you know, we have to think about it. So many people think, well, giants were just myth. Giants were just angel, uh, excuse me, just uh, fairy tales. You know, we all grew up listening to people telling us fairy tales about things like that. But usually there's a little seed of truth even to a fairy tale, and so uh, we have to consider that. So let's see what evidence we have of angels. Um, first, let's uh, look at the word uh, giants in verse 4. In Hebrew, the word is Nephilim. Now, Nephilim in Hebrew means fallen ones. So uh, uh, when it was translated into Greek, they they used the word gigantus, and the word gigantus we think of as giant, and it's come to mean that because they were giant, they were big, but the word actually means earthborn in Greek. So we have Nephilim, the fallen ones, and then it was translated gigantus, the earthborn. So we're kind of getting that connection there a little bit, and then it goes on to say, um, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. Now that's that is emphasizing what they what was just said about the giants. So often in the Bible, God will give you a statement, and then He will reinforce it, maybe in slightly different words, so you can have a complete understanding. If you don't understand the first one, you'll understand the second part. And so here He's got that in the same 
section there where he's talking about the daughters of men and they bear children to them. The same became mighty men of old, men of renown. And the word mighty men uh, in Greek is called titans. And we're all familiar with the word titans. We, our children, our grandchildren, and we've grown up with stories of the titans and the, the Greek myths, so-called, you know, the, the, the gods, little g, that came down and had relations with women, with human women. And so this just fits right in. Uh, they have turned those into their myths. They believe those were their gods. And so we've got that evidence. Now, um, the mighty men of renown. Uh, so we've covered that a little bit. Uh, some of the mighty men of renown that we would recognize would be Hercules and Atlas. Those two were, the, were considered titans. And we, we see that all the time in movies and, and uh, videos and games. Uh, so it's being promoted now uh, to our new generations that are coming out. And um, they just love that type of thing, don't they? So it's, it's easy to see how, how it, they can be taken over by it. Um, now, as far as evidence of the, uh, of the of the giants, excuse me, uh, throughout the rest of the Bible. Uh, I'm going to have you go to Genesis 14 in the last part of verse 5. And um, it speaks of the Raphim. And uh, there are a lot of big words here. I hope I can pronounce them all. Uh, and smote the Raphim in Ashtaroth, Karnaim, and the Suzim in Ham, and the Emin in Shavakariya, Thaim. Now, these... Uh, different uh, words here are different tribes that were the Nephilim, that were Raphim. Raphim is another word that's used in the Bible for the giants. So whenever you see Raphim, you understand that. Now, uh, Zuzim was one tribe or one clan of giants. Uh, the Emim were another one. And uh, I want to go back to the word Raphim, which... Uh, Actually, uh, the word is uh, muth, which means dead. And this word means um, that dead that has no hope of living again. It's not the, not the same word that's used for humans that die. So uh, there's another little indication that they are different. They have no hope. And so uh, we want to go to Isaiah 26:14. And uh, this speaks again of the same. It says, they are dead, they shall not live. They are deceased, they shall not rise. And here Isaiah is speaking of the Raphim that, have, that are dead now. They will never rise again. Um, they would be considered hybrids today. We would call them hybrids, half man, half another being. Uh, then you go to Deuteronomy 2, 10, and 11, and it speaks of the Amim. The Amim dwelt therein in times past, a people great and many, tall as the Anakim, which were accounted as giants. So Anakim were uh, another uh, group of giants, and Anakim means long-necked. And so uh, it gives us a picture, and they must have had extra long necks. Um, Deuteronomy 3, 11 and 12, and Joshua 13, uh, verse 12, both speak of the King Og of Bashan, the king of the Raphaim, and his bed was between 13 and a half feet and 15 feet long, and it was made of iron because it had to be pretty strong. So he would have had to have been a big, big guy. And um, I've seen a little chart where it shows you know, man, and then it showed Goliath, and then it showed Og. <laughs> And uh, quite, quite an amazing thing. Um, when God gives names, these were real people, real, real beings. Um, now, another one, another um, group of the uh, giants were the Amorites. And uh, King Og was also part of that. He was considered an Amorite. They were mountainous people that lived in Bashan. And if you have your, your uh, map that uh, shows of Israel, uh, 
You know that up above is Galilee and down below is the Dead Sea. The upper part above Galilee up towards uh, Syria and Lebanon would be the Bashan area. And that's where it's mountainous and that's where King Og lived in that area. And it's very interesting that when the Israelites came in with Joshua uh, to their promised land, there were three main routes into the area, into Israel. Uh, one came through from Egypt along the coast. There was another one that was down in the Moab area down below the Dead Sea coming from Arabia, and I believe that's the one that they came through. And the other entry was up above in the Bashan area coming from uh, Syria and Lebanon. So they were, they had a strategy and they were, uh, really I believe Satan had this all involved. Uh, you know, he was really trying to thwart God's plan every which way. Every time we turn around we see him trying to thwart God's plan. And he knew that if he could block those three areas it would make it more difficult for anyone to come in. And so um, that's where he had them stationed. Uh, another of the groups of people were the Amalekites that we read about, and those are in Exodus 17:8. Uh, and uh, Amalekite means serpent-like demons, and it uh, gives a connotation that they were vampire-like. So uh, very strange people. Now, there are um, many people that believe that a lot of the giants were cannibalistic. Uh, there's some indication in the Bible it, it, it kind of gives a feeling that they might be. You know, it could be in interpreted uh, as a allegory, but it, it could be very possibly be true. So uh, we don't know, but um, they were terrible. The meme actually means terrible ones. Uh, they, uh, they just brought terror and horror to anyone that was around them. Um, the Zuzim were restless roamers, and they lived east of the Jordan River, um, where, where Jordan would be now. And uh, they were, uh, they never really settled. They were just always marauding, <laughs> going around. Uh, the Anakim I mentioned before, the long necks, they are mentioned in Numbers 13, 32, and 33, and in Joshua 15, 13, and 14. Then we come to the Gittites. Now, the Gittites were uh, from Gath, and you might recognize Gath because uh, we all know Goliath, and he was from Gath. So he was part of this group. And um, that comes in 2 Samuel 21, 20. Uh, he had they listed four other giants, and most people believe those were his brothers. That's why uh, David picked up five stones, because he was going to take care of the other four brothers if he had to also. Uh, and then it also names, uh, it un leaves one giant unnamed. But it does describe him, and it says, that he had six fingers and six toes on each hand and each foot. Now, this is very interesting because throughout history, giants have been known to have six fingers and six toes. Even here in America, they've found uh, giant skeletons and having that. And so uh, it is thought possible that when the, uh, when the Israelites came in, some of them scattered and spread throughout, uh, and that's where some of them came to America. Now, there's an interesting story about William Cody, who was Buffalo Bill. He wrote a journal, and uh, in his journal, he described uh, being with uh, one of the tribes of the Native Americans, and they brought out to him a thigh bone that was very, very large, and he said he would have brought it with him, but he didn't have, he was on horseback, he didn't have any way to carry it, so he left it there. But he, he said that the, the tribal members said that there was an ancient group of people, including the, the thigh bone person, uh, who uh, would run along with a buffalo, and they would actually be able to grab one. Uh, and he said, uh, they said that these people were three times bigger than they were. And also he said that the, the reason that they would lift their hand when they greeted someone was to make sure 
they didn't have six fingers. <laughs> it wasn't how, that was just kind of a, a movie thing, you know, that they brought out. But they did, they did lift their hand to show they were friendly and they were human. Um, just interesting little tidbits there, you know. Uh, there have been many, many uh, skeletons found uh, throughout um, all of the world, actually. But here in America, many, many. Uh, however, many of them have disappeared for some strange reason. Uh, there are those who really don't want us to understand about those things. Um, going back to uh, the Nephilim, uh, being the children of the fallen angels, um, I have one more verse, and it says, Amos... Uh, says in 2 and verse 9 and 10, uh, describing the Nephilim, whose height was like the height of cedars. So here we understand that uh, they were pretty big, maybe even bigger than we uh, think of now. You know, We think of a 12-foot person as being a giant. Perhaps they were even bigger. Uh, why is this re relevant to us today, though? Um, the Lord said, as in the days of Noah. So this pattern that we see in the days of Noah, right, both days are going to be repeating. It's the same pattern. Now, we don't understand. We don't know if they're going to be giants again. But things are going to be similar, not possibly, probably exactly like it was. Uh, Satan used giants in those days to affect the DNA but he can do it in other ways now. And so we're seeing a lot of experiments throughout uh, uh, universities and, and countries all over the world with uh, working with hybrids, you know, mixing uh, DNA of animals and humans and plants. And uh, we just don't know where that's going to go, but possibly this could be uh, a part of the whole thing uh, for our future. So we need to know these things because over and over Yeshua said, do not be deceived. We have to be open to these things and be wise and to understand. Now, why did the Lord have to destroy the earth? This is something that I've really considered. You know, they were very evil people. There's no doubt about that. But what was so terrible that he had to destroy all the animals and everything? I mean, it's this question that we really need to ask. And uh, one possibility is that there were hybrids. When we look at the mythology of the Greeks and, and many of the other um, Romans, you know, you, all through you, you know, all through the uh, the world, you can find these uh, mythical creatures, half human. Uh, you find them in, in the hieroglyphics you know, in Egypt, uh, where there's a head of a wolf or a head of a bird, and then the body, and uh, Perhaps those things were really happening then. We don't know. Uh, maybe there was a seed of truth to those myths. Um, Satan is still tempting, uh, attempting to thwart God's uh, plan. And uh, we see that over and over again. And he hasn't stopped. Even though he knows that he's been defeated, he still feels that he has a chance. And so he's not going to quit until he absolutely has to. So... We need to be aware of those things uh, and uh, see the world through the eyes of uh, what was going on then. And maybe we can understand our world a little bit better. Um, next week, we are going to uh, talk about uh, the rest of chapter 6. And we're going to find out that Noah's going to build a box. And that's what the ark actually means, a box. And... Uh, I hope we'll have some video. Uh, we'll see if that we can get the video working because there's a, a very good uh, video from Ken Ham, uh, The Ark Encounter, and he goes all through the ark that uh, has been uh, built in Kentucky uh, just to show how things were probably done there. You know, we have a good indication of things like that. So that's going to be a real interesting thing. If uh, you get a chance to watch that on YouTube on your own, why go ahead and watch it. It lasts about 30 minutes, so it's going to be a really good thing. And if you have any children, that would be a really good thing to be uh, showing them. Now, if you want notes on uh, this chapter that we've started, or if you want uh, notes on the previous chapters, 
the Calvary Chapel is going to be putting a little box outside near the front doors, and uh, they will be available for you to uh, come and, and get them there. So we'll have them for you. If you have any questions or any comments, uh, I'd be happy to uh, deal with those. Um, I just want everyone to remember that um, during those last days, God was busy. He was calling out to his people for 120 years. In chapter 3, it says, uh, the days shall be 120. And uh, I've come to believe that he is referring there to the time period that, that uh, Noah was building. And all that time, Noah was preaching. Noah was called a preacher. He was a prophet. And yet, no one turned in that whole time. But God is so faithful and loves his people so much that those, uh, he's just calling everyone. And he's doing that today, and we see that every day um, as we're going through this uh, trial that we have now, uh, calling out and how people are receiving him and, and learning more about him. So um, there's another thing. Uh, nothing has changed. God is still the same. He's still the same loving God and uh, still wants no one to perish Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him, and I will sup with him and he with me. And what a reassuring thing for that, you know. He's waiting there. He's the gentleman. I've always heard, you know, God is a gentleman. But he's there for you. All you have to do is just say, here I am. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry for the way I've lived. I want to live with you. I want to live for you, Lord. I want you to be in my life. And I just want you to have his peace and have his shalom. You know, the word shalom is um, a wonderful word because it includes everything possible that we could ever want. Every, everything that we need and desire is in that shalom. And that's what I wish for you. Thank you. Father God, we just thank you again, Lord, for uh, being with us. And, and we just ask you, Lord, that uh, you'll reach many people throughout this time, that you will use this to bring more to you, Lord. And we thank you for your provisions. We thank you for your loving care. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.